Hey guys and welcome to another tutorial. In this video we'll be talking about nephrons and their structure and ultrafiltration and all those good stuff. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to look at is nephrons and their structure. So each kidney is made up of thousands of tiny tubules that are called nephrons. Now the role of the kidneys in excretion is carried out by these individual nephrons. So by studying how a nephron works, we can then understand the overall function of the kidney. Now nephrons are way too small to be seen with the naked eye and it's even difficult with a microscope to see it very clearly because of its winding structure. In a human, each kidney contains an estimated 1 million nephrons and each of these nephrons have an approximate length of 3 centimeters. So this means that the total length of the tubules in each kidney is roughly around 120 kilometers. And this offers an enormous surface area for the exchange of the materials. So now that we know what nephrons are, let's look at their structure. Each nephron is composed of six regions and each region has its own particular structure and function. The first region is called the Malpighian body, which is also known as the renal corpuscle. And this comprises of the glomerulus as well as the Bowman's capsule, which is also known as the renal capsule. The second region is the proximal convoluted tubule, which is then followed by the descending limb of the loop of Henle. The fourth region is called the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and this is followed by the distal convoluted tubule. Finally, we reach the sixth region which is called the collecting duct. Now there are two types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. These are situated in different parts of the kidney and they have different uses. Cortical nephrons are found in the cortex, hence it's called cortical, and they have relatively short loops of Henle which just extend into the medulla. Now under normal conditions of water availability, these nephrons deal with the control of blood volume, since shorter loops of Henle equal less surface area to absorb or retain water. On the other hand, juxtamedullary nephrons have their renal corpuscles close to, hence juxta, the junction of the cortex and the medulla. They have very long loops of Henle which extend deep into the medulla. Now when water is in short supply, increased water retention occurs through the juxtamedullary nephrons since longer loop of Henle means there is more surface area to retain water. Each nephron begins as a cup-shaped structure called a renal or Bowman's capsule and it is found in the cortex of the kidney. The renal capsules of all the nephrons, regardless of the type, is found in the cortex of the kidney. Now from the renal capsule, the tube runs towards the center of the kidney, first forming a twisted region called the proximal convoluted tubule, and then it makes a long hairpin loop in the medulla called the loop of Henle. The tubule then turns back up through the cortex and forms another twisted region that is called the distal convoluted tubule. Finally, it joins a collecting duct, which then leads down through the medulla and into the pelvis of the kidney. Here, the collecting ducts join the ureter. Now something to note is that blood vessels are closely associated with the nephrons. Each renal capsule is supplied with blood by a branch of the renal artery that is called the afferent arteriole. The blood is at very high pressure since the renal arteries are short and they are also not far away from the heart. This splits into a knot of capillaries in the cup of the renal capsule that is called a glomerulus. The capillaries of the glomerulus rejoin to form an efferent arteriole. The hydrostatic blood pressure in the glomerulus, as we mentioned before, is raised further by the fact that the diameter of the efferent arteriole, which carries blood away from the glomerulus, is much smaller than that of the afferent arteriole. So as the blood enters the narrow capillaries, pressure rises. The efferent arteriole then leads off to form a network of capillaries running closely alongside the rest of the nephron before linking up with the other capillaries to feed into a branch of the renal vein. This leads us to ultrafiltration. Now ultrafiltration as the name suggests involves filtration under pressure. It looks at filtration on a micro scale. Ultrafiltration happens in the renal capsules, also known as the Bowman's capsules, and the pressure comes from the blood pressure and is known as hydrostatic pressure or pumping pressure. This high pressure is as a result of the blood entering the glomerulus directly from the heart via the dorsal aorta, and then the renal artery and finally an arteriole. This process filters out really nice small molecules from the blood into the nephrons. Now one thing to note before we move on 
is anytime you hear the word lumen, lumen refers to the cavity or space inside some sort of tubular structure. So with that in mind, the blood in the glomerulus is separated from the lumen of the renal capsule, so the space inside the capsule, by three layers. Two of those are cell layers and one is a basement membrane. So the first cell layer is the lining called the endothelium of the blood capillary. This is very thin and it's perforated with thousands of pores of about 10 millimeters in diameter. Now all constituents of blood plasma can seep through this layer. The pores are not a barrier to plasma proteins because they are too large. Blood cells, however, they cannot usually pass through. The second layer is the inner wall of the Bowman's capsule which is made up of podocytes. Now lying closely against the endothelium is a basement membrane and against that is a layer of cells making up the lining of the renal capsule. These cells are called podocytes. Pod means foot and these cells have a very unusual structure. They have many foot-like extensions projecting from its surface that wrap themselves closely around the capillary loops of the glomerulus. The extensions interlink with the extensions from neighboring cells. They fit together loosely, leaving tiny slits called pores between these interlocking cells. These slits are about 25 nanometers wide and a filtered fluid can pass through these slits. The diameter of the afferent arterial that brings blood to the glomerulus is greater than the diameter of the efferent arterial that carries it away. And this results in a buildup of hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerular capillaries. Now as a result, blood plasma is forced out through the pores in the capillaries, through the basement membrane and then through the slits between the podocytes. The fluid that seeps through into the cavity of the renal capsule is known as glomerular filtrate. It is the basement membrane however that acts as the main filtration barrier. So this brings us to number three, the basement membrane. The basement membrane consists of a meshwork of fibers including collagen and fibers. No cells can get through this filter. For example, red blood cells and platelets are way too large and not all the components of blood plasma can either. Usually only molecules with a relative molecular mass of less than 68,000 can pass through this membrane. So for example, water and small solid molecules they can pass through. It acts as a filter between the blood and the cavity. All constituents of blood plasma other than plasma proteins are able to pass through. Hence it's also called a dialyzin membrane. Protein molecules are too large and they are also repelled by the negative electrical charges on the fibers. Now even though molecules with a RMM of less than 68,000 can pass through, not all do. Only 20% of these substances enter the Bowman's capsule. The remaining 80% flow on with the rest of the blood into the efferent arterial. The glomerular filtrate which enters the nephron at the Bowman's capsule consists of inorganic ions, glucose, amino acids, vitamins, some hormones, and nitrogenous waste, which is mainly urea but also some uric acid and creatinine, all dissolved in water. The concentration of each of these solutes is the same as it is in the blood plasma, which goes to the efferent arterial. However, as the plasma also contains the plasma proteins in solution, because they're too big to pass through the membrane, the total concentration of all the solutes is greater in the plasma. Blood passing from the glomerulus has a lower water potential due to the increased concentrations of plasma proteins and a reduced hydrostatic pressure. Now let's look at the forces acting during ultrafiltration. So firstly, there's a difference between the hydrostatic pressure of the blood and the hydrostatic pressure of the filtrate, which causes a net flow of liquid into the capsule. Secondly, there's a difference between the solute potential of the filtrate and the plasma, which causes a net flow of water to move by osmosis out of the capsule and into the blood. As the difference in hydrostatic pressures is greater than the difference in solute potentials, there's an overall net flow of filtrate into the capsule. Now, it's also good to know some of the factors that affect the glomerular filtration rate. Filtration rate can be increased by raising the blood pressure. It can also be raised by dilating the afferent arterioles in what is called vasodilation and therefore decreasing the resistance to the flow of blood into the glomerulus. Another regulatory mechanism is to increase the resistance in efferent arterioles by constricting them. This is called vasoconstriction. Now just some extra information for you awesome people. In humans, the blood flow to the kidneys is so high that all the blood flows through the kidneys about once every five minutes. Efficient ultrafiltration produces approximately 125 centimeters cubed of glomerular filtrate every minute. That's 180 decimeter cubed per day. And that's a lot considering a typical adult has about five to six decimeter cube of blood. Now consider that value. 
180 decimeter cube of filtrate a day. If all of this filtrate were allowed to pass out of the body, dehydration would take place severely. So the rest of the nephron is concerned with the reabsorption of essential solutes and the return of about 99% of the water so that eventually only about one centimeter cube of urine is produced per minute. Now this video does not include selective reabsorption. Selective reabsorption, I will be looking at that in my next video. So be sure to subscribe so you will see that video. I hope you guys enjoy this and you learn something from it. If you did, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to see more of my tutorials which will be coming up soon. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time.